Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 10, and we're going to finish the chapter with verses 46 through 52. Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem. And in this passage that concludes the chapter, he's joined by a new pilgrim. We read, beginning in verse 46, Then they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Now that second phrase there after Bartimaeus is an explanation of his name. Evidently, uh, Mark wrote this for the sake of the the Romans explaining the name of uh, Bartimaeus. Bar is Aramaic for son, and Timaeus is uh, his father's name. So Bartimaeus was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. A.T. Pearson was a minister of a few generations ago who made the observation that every parable of Jesus was a miracle of wisdom And every miracle of Jesus was a parable of teaching. Mark 10 is an example of both. Early in the chapter, Jesus gives a parable, or rather a miracle of wisdom, when he tells a parable about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Now at the end of the chapter, he gives a parable of teaching when he does a miracle, that of giving sight to a blind man. That's our lesson. And what this parable of teaching teaches us is how a person enters the kingdom of God. Earlier, the rich young ruler showed how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And now Bartimaeus, the beggar, shows how simple it is to enter the kingdom. It is by grace through faith. It must be by grace because all of us by nature naturally are just like Bartimaeus, spiritually blind, unable to know God's truth. That's our condition. And we must understand that if we are to seek the remedy. Left to ourselves, we would remain in darkness. But all who seek, find. They find because he first finds us. They come because he first comes to them. And all who come to him, he receives. That's what Bartimaeus discovered when he cried out for mercy and received it. It happened, Mark says, at Jericho, the city that was famous in the Old Testament for Joshua's battle when the army of Israel marched around the city and its walls fell down. But a greater Joshua came to the city and he did an even greater miracle when he made the wall of darkness fall from the eyes of a poor man who had been sitting by the road begging. It was common in those days for beggars to sit along a busy path. It's common today. I've mentioned before of how things are in modern Jerusalem, at least how they were when I was there many years ago. But Jewish beggars would sit along Jaffa Road, one of the main streets 
in the town where lots of traffic passed. And Arab beggars would sit at the Damascus Gate, a busy gate into the old city. And the same ones would sit there in the same place every day. And as you passed by, you recognize them, become somewhat acquainted by them, at least by sight, the lame, the blind. And there they were with a bowl at their feet asking for alms. And it was probably the same in Jericho in Jesus' day. The lame and blind sat in the same place every day begging. And as Jesus was leaving the city, one of the blind men cried out for mercy. Matthew and Luke also record this event in their Gospels, but with some differences. In, in Matthew, there are two blind men. And in Luke, this incident occurred as Jesus was approaching Jericho rather than as Jesus was leaving Jericho. Now, those differences are not difficult to explain. There were two blind men, but only one is singled out by Mark and by Luke, and probably because he became prominent in the church later. The difference in location is explained by the fact that there were two Jerichos at that time. There was the old city, which lay largely in ruins, and a new city about a mile away that Herod had built. The incident occurred between the two. Matthew and Mark mentioned the old city, that Jesus was leaving it, passing through it when he met the blind men. And Luke mentions the new city as Jesus was approaching it when he met them. Luke's interest was in the new Jericho because that is where the next incident occurred, the incident that he recorded when Jesus met Zacchaeus, the short tax collector. So there's no difficulty in the records of these uh, Gospels. Now, as Jesus was leaving the old city and approaching the new, he was accompanied by his disciples along with a number of pilgrims, all going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It was customary for important rabbis to travel with a group of people and teach them as they walked along, and Jesus may have been doing just that. That's when one of the beggars named Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was there. He may have been sitting near the gate of the city where the, the traffic would have slowed down and there had been some congestion and he could get the attention of those who were passing by. That would have been his normal practice. But on this day, it wasn't that he got their attention initially. It's that the crowd got his attention. He heard from them that Jesus the Nazarene was there and passing by. He responded immediately and began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now that was an enlightened response, especially in contrast to the crowd that called Jesus the Nazarene, the man from Nazareth. That's what he is to that crowd. Great man, good man, but he's the man from Nazareth. Bartimaeus knew that he was far more than that. He is the son of David, which is a way of identifying the Messiah. We can only guess how he learned so much about the Lord, how he knew what, who he was immediately, but you can imagine that sitting by a busy road in an important town like Jericho, he heard lots of news day after day, and the blind often become good listeners. And as travelers and merchants and pilgrims from distant parts of the land passed by, he heard about Jesus. He heard about this rabbi from Nazareth who was doing amazing things. He heard that he was teaching about the kingdom and doing miracles, cleansing lepers and healing the lame. In the town of Nain, he had raised the only son who had died of a, of a widow. These things came to him. He learned this news and, and learned that Jesus had opened the eyes of the blind. That was one of the wonders prophesied of the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 29, that out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. That was Bartimaeus. He was in darkness. And if 
being in darkness gave him any advantage, then it, it blocked out all of the visual distractions that he might have had. In fact, all of the distractions that he might have had had he had a normal life and been going about his business and not sensed any need and was busy with business and busy with family and busy with all of these things. But being blind, all of that was set aside. All of that was blocked out. And it, it might have allowed him, and it seems to have allowed him to think more and to develop an inner life. Well, he obviously had done that because though uh, he was uh, able to kind of contemplate the words of the prophet Isaiah and then consider the things that Isaiah said in light of the events of his day and put it all together and put it all together very correctly that Isaiah's prophecy had been fulfilled. The Messiah had come. He was Bartimaeus' hope. The one that could open the eyes of the blind. But then he, the Lord, was way up in Galilee and Bartimaeus was down in Jericho and unable to leave. How would a blind man find Jesus anyway? He was helpless. It must have seemed to him like hope was, was there, but just out of reach. Then unexpectedly, Jesus was there, passing by. And excitedly, he began crying out to the Lord for help. Son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd around Jesus was not excited for Bartimaeus and tried to silence him. Maybe Jesus was teaching at what these rabbis would do and, and, and this blind beggar is over there interrupting what he's saying and after all he's just a beggar and a nuisance. So they tried to shut him up. That happens to people who are thinking about spiritual things. That happens to people who are thinking about salvation. Satan tries to quiet them or distract them, get them off the problem, and certainly get them away from the solution. That's what the Lord taught in the parable of the soils in chapter 4. Seed fell on ground beside the road, and it was eaten by the birds. That was Satan, Jesus explained, snatching away the gospel that was sown in the minds of hearers so that they lost interest and they forgot about it. C.S. Lewis picked up on that in the screw tape letters when the master demon instructs his nephew demon Wormwood on his mission in the world. And he had been assigned to follow a man and, and, and keep this individual out of the Lord's influence. And screw tape, in his first letter to his nephew, wrote, Remember, Wormwood, you are there to fuddle him. Well, that's what the devil is trying to do to us. Or if not the devil, then the human heart. Because as Jeremiah says, it's deceitful above all things. And one of the deceitful things about the human heart that it convinces us of is we can put things off. Procrastination. It'll say, there's no hurry about this. You're young, you have plenty of time. Well, you can get to this later. Put your Bible down and look at the sports page. Or get out on the golf course. There's always time for this. But there isn't. There isn't always time for this. And there wasn't time for Bartimaeus. And he knew that. The, the crowd tried to fuddle him, but Mark wrote, he kept crying all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. His cry for mercy was an act of faith. We don't ask for help from someone we think cannot give us help. And when we know that someone can give us help, and their help is necessary, in fact, if they're the only one that can help, we're persistent in that. We keep going back to that person and insisting on them being the help and giving the help that we need. Persistent, persevering prayer is a sign of genuine faith. It's an evidence of faith. When faith is lacking, persistence is lacking. 
We stop because we really don't think there's much hope or much help in, in, in that anyway. And so by crying out all the more, Bartimaeus showed that his faith was not half-hearted. He believed in Jesus as the Messiah and he would not let his opportunity pass. How different he was from that rich young ruler. People often wonder what happened to him. In fact, not long after I, about a week or so after I taught on that passage, someone asked me, what do you think happened to him? Think he ever believed? And that's what you wonder. You, 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 you wish it were true, but we don't know. What happened to him? There is no rest of the story as far as we know. No indication in anything that he reconsidered his decision to walk away from the Lord and return to him. No evidence of that. His opportunity came and he left disappointed and as far as we know he disappears from the pages of scripture. Bartimaeus was different. He would not let his opportunity pass. So against the protests of the crowd, he continued to cry out to the Lord. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel and would not let the angel go until he blessed him. Even though he was in pain and he was disabled, Jacob hung on and hung on until he received a blessing. And so too, Bartimaeus persisted. He had a clear sense of urgency, as men ought to have about their souls. It is those who seek for blessings that obtain them. And that's what the scriptures instruct us to do, to seek, to seek earnestly. It's what the Lord told his people to do in Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's how Bartimaeus sought the Lord's blessing here. This was his moment, and he refused to be denied. And so he kept crying out for mercy. The Lord likes that. You might hear, or you might think, well, I, I bother him. I don't want to bother him. Like, he's one of us. He's not. The Lord likes this. He likes persistence. We see that here, his response. And in his response, we get a glimpse into our Lord's heart. Mark wrote in verse 49 that Jesus stopped and said, call him here. He was on his way to Jerusalem. That was the, the goal of his mission. Jerusalem was the city of destiny for him. He was on his way that is the reason he'd come into the world. Nothing was going to distract him from it. He had set his face like flint to go there and accomplish his mission. But here, when this blind beggar cried out for mercy, a man everyone wanted him to ignore, Jesus stopped and called him. Again, that gives us a glimpse into the heart of the Savior. He's never too busy for us. He's always ready to answer a cry for mercy. That will make him stop and help every time. We see that all the way back to the book of Exodus when Israel was enslaved in Egypt. It was hard, it was crushing. The people sighed because of the bondage and cried out for help. And Moses wrote in Exodus 2, so God heard their groaning. He saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. He never ignores our cries for help. Never <clears throat> rejects those who seek. He promised that in John chapter 6 and verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. In other words, Satan can never fuddle them, not ultimately. And the one who comes to me, Jesus said, I will certainly not cast out. So if we are in distress, if we feel helpless, then we need to cry out to him for help. And keep crying out to him. Faithful prayer is persistent prayer. That, that's how we are to pray. Persistently, earnestly. 
and believe that God hears us. He heard Bartimaeus over the crowd and in spite of their protests, and he called them to himself. In fact, when the messengers came to him, they said, take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. And that was indirectly the encouragement of Jesus to this man. In other words, don't be deterred by the crowd and the opposition. Persist. Come. You'll be rewarded for it. And that is the encouragement that he gives to us. That's the encouragement that he gives to all of his people. Bartimaeus didn't hesitate. He responded quickly. Another evidence of faith. Mark writes that he threw aside his cloak, jumped up, and came to Jesus. <clears throat> yeah, his cloak was probably all that he owned in the world. But he forgot all about it. He, he threw it aside. He didn't want anything to get in the way and hinder his coming to Christ. The rich man couldn't do that. The rich man couldn't throw aside his riches and follow him, but Bartimaeus threw aside everything that he had, his cloak, the few coins that he may have collected, to come to him. When he came, Jesus questioned him and, and asked, what do you want me to do for you? So far, he'd only asked for mercy, so the Lord, in effect, told him, put your need in words. Get specific. Well, the Lord knew his need. And he, he, he knew that Bartimaeus wasn't crying out for mercy, meaning give me some coins, give me some shekels. But he wanted Bartimaeus to reflect on his condition and to ask, and in so doing, to express his trust in Christ. And it's the same for us. The Lord wants real fellowship with us. He, he wants us to get personal and specific with him. Now, I don't think we need to do that with others so much. It's good to have a confidant. It's good to have a close friend, someone you can talk to on a very personal level. I don't think we need too many people in that role, but we always have that, and we have the best confidant in Jesus Christ, who is very personal with every one of his people, and we are to speak very <coughs> privately and personally with him. He is the one who cares more than any. He is the one who knows and can really help. We have a living Savior seated at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us, who knows us better than we know ourselves and invites us to have fellowship with him. And as I said, can really help as no one else can. And, and as we are personal, as we speak specifically to him about our needs and we cry out to him for help, we then see at his time the answers that he gives to our needs. And that strengthens our faith. But also before that, those who come to the Lord who seek his salvation need to know their helplessness. That they are blind and that they are deaf and that they are lame. They are in utter need of his mercy and should say it should recognize it. Bartimaeus did. He knew his need very well and answered the Lord, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. Matthew wrote that when he said that, Jesus was moved with compassion. How often do we see that in the Gospels? Very often. He is not indifferent to our needs and conditions. Then Matthew tells us Jesus touched the eyes of Bartimaeus and his friend. Mark records not what he did, but what he said, which is unusual for Mark. He's the gospel writer who records the actions of Jesus more than his words, but here he records his words. Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. 
Immediately, Mark writes, his characteristic term, immediately he regained his sight and began to follow him on the road. Well, the Lord didn't tell him to follow, as he told the rich young ruler to do. In fact, the Lord released Bartimaeus and said, go. You're free to leave. But Bartimaeus followed Jesus freely, gladly. What a difference between Bartimaeus and the rich young ruler. One rich, the other poor. One with great advantage, the other without any advantage at all. One thought Jesus was a good man, a good teacher. The other knew he was far more than that, that he is the Messiah, the son of David. Both heard, only one believed. It's all of grace. The rich young ruler ran to Jesus not knowing who he was and thinking that he could earn his salvation. Bartimaeus was sitting, begging, when Jesus came to him. He came to a blind beggar because the blind beggar could not come to him. And hearing that Jesus was there, he cried out for mercy, and Jesus answered his cry. He always does. Bartimaeus put it, to put it in the words of the old hymn, was a debtor to mercy alone. And we all are. No one can be saved by his or her works. The things we do will not save us. The things we do will not erase the guilt and sin that we have accumulated. The blind man did nothing to open his eyes. It was all done by the power and the mercy of Christ. Still, still, he sought Christ. That's how salvation comes to every person who is saved. At God's initiative and at his time. When he comes, people respond. And they respond because Christ calls forth faith from them. He creates faith in them. It is all a gift of sovereign grace. Paul puts that very clearly in Ephesians chapter 2. Begins, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Ephesians, remember this. But God being rich in mercy made you alive. And then in verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. Everything connected with it is a gift. Faith is a gift of God. A man cannot save himself. The blind man could not open his eyes. The blind man could not give himself sight. It was all done by the power and the mercy of God. Still, he sought Christ. And when the Lord calls a person to himself, when the Holy Spirit draws that person to the Savior, there will be a response. And it is a genuine, genuine response of the individual. He or she believes. God doesn't believe for us. It is our faith. It's our understanding. It is the result, though, of God's grace, his prevenient grace, the grace of God leading up to it, the, the grace of God in regeneration in the new birth of opening the eyes of our heart but when those eyes are open when God has taken the, the heart of stone out and replaced it with the heart of flesh when he has made us alive faith is inevitable in its instant we cannot but believe we respond to, to what we see and what we know because of the enlightenment and the grace of God that he has given us. We are responsible to do that. I would say even we're responsible to stir ourselves up, to, to seek his grace as Bartimaeus did. In, in, intelligently, according to the revelation of scripture, he, he had a knowledge of the word of God and we're to respond according to that knowledge, according to that revelation and respond earnestly and urgently. It is urgent. Christ never went through Jericho again. That was Bartimaeus' opportunity. And by God's grace, he seized it. He believed. 
And that's how people are to respond. And those who do stay with Christ. They follow him the rest of their lives and they glorify him in their lives. There he was. Following him on the road. That's how our text ends. And as it ends, as, as I read that, I thought of John Calvin's words. He described Christians as always on the road, meaning we're always pilgrims. We're passing through this world. And that, that is Bartimaeus. That's the Christian. That's the Christian life, following Christ and glorifying him gladly. Glorifying him gladly, obeying him gladly. That really is the only way that we can glorify him with, with joy for all that he has done for us, thanksgiving for all that he has done for us. And what he has done for us is everything. Everything. That's what the Lord said earlier in the chapter when he told the parable of the camel going through the eye of a needle, what A.T. Pearson called a miracle of wisdom. And it was a miracle of wisdom. And, and the, the genius of it is really seen in the absurdity of the picture that the Lord painted. The very idea is, is impossible, a camel passing through the eye of a needle. But it is more impossible, if we can say one thing is more impossible than another, more impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that, you'll remember, astonished the disciples. If a rich man who had been given all the blessings, been blessed by the Lord God as this young man had been, had all of those advantages, if that man who had been so greatly blessed cannot enter, then who can be saved? That's what they were asking. And Jesus answered, with people, it is impossible. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. You can have all of the advantages in the world. Wealth, health, the Bible, good parents and teachers, everything that you can imagine, every advantage that you can imagine, and still, it is impossible to be saved. That's what Christ said. If, if, even if we are rich, even if that's our condition and that's the blessings that we enjoy, even if we are rich, we are like Bartimaeus. Poor, blind beggars. We have nothing of value to offer God. And we don't want what he offers to us because we're spiritually blind. We don't see it. We don't understand it. And the hope of eternal life that is set forth in the word of God and set forth specifically in the gospel seems foolish to us, foolish to the natural man. Paul said that in Romans 8, verse 7, the mind set on the flesh, that is, the natural man, the man apart from grace, the man without faith, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. He doesn't want to please God. He's hostile in his mind and his heart and his behavior. And then Paul adds that he cannot please God. So it is impossible with man but not with God. He is the good shepherd who goes out and finds the lost sheep, as he did Bartimaeus, calls him and restores his sight. He does everything. That's why Bartimaeus followed the Lord without even asking him. The Lord didn't say, follow me. Bartimaeus did it naturally. That's the response of those who understand the grace of God, who understand sovereign grace. And when you realize that he found you poor and blind and made you see and made you rich, truly rich for all eternity. What Mike spoke of last time he spoke on Proverbs, enduring wealth. Wealth that goes beyond this life into the next. Wealth that's forever. When you realize what he has done for you, made you rich today in this world because he always is with us, always providing for those who faithfully walk with him and blesses us in all eternity with 
wealth and riches beyond our comprehension. When you understand that, that it all comes from his hand, then you will want to follow Christ gladly. I like the statement by the Scot Thomas Erskine. I've said it many times, so I obviously like it. <clears throat> he said, in the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. I think that sums it up very well. In, in the world, religion is just the opposite. Religion is ethics. Religion is effort. It is all about what shall I do to inherit eternal life. It's all works and merit and not gratitude. In the New Testament, religion is grace. It's all about God's sovereign gift to us and the response of ethics is that that comes out of thanksgiving, out of gratitude. We do what we do because we're so thankful for what the Lord has done for us. We're glad to respond to Him. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. The love of Christ controls us, or as the King James has it, constrains us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. When we understand what he did when he died, that he saved us. Through his death, he, he snatched us, as the Lord said in the prophet Zechariah, like a brand from the burning. His love for us controls us, constrains us, compels us to follow. This miracle is a parable of teaching. It illustrates who we are apart from God's intervention and grace and reminds us of our dependence on the Lord even now that we have believed. Even for believers, we are totally, completely dependent upon Him. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers. Prayed for believers. Men and women who had new hearts, whose eyes had been opened, but nevertheless he prays that the eyes of their heart would be opened so that they would know the hope of his calling and the vastness of their riches. He's praying that for believers. We, we continually need to have insight and understanding and growth in the things of God. And we don't have it. And our lack of knowledge affects us. I'm talking to you as a believer in Jesus Christ, as one who is born again with a new nature, you still need enlightenment. We all need enlightenment. And when we don't have it, what we don't have slows us down in our spiritual progress so that we don't follow as we ought. But as we learn, we grow. And there is nothing more important than learning and knowing what we once were and what God has done for us and what He has done for us is everything. He has given you spiritual sight. He has given you life everlasting. So follow Him. Follow Him. But for you who have not believed, if you happen to be here, listen. You may be thinking, this is naive. This is just a story, not true. And if Jesus lived, he was just the Nazarene. Not the son of David, not the son of God, just a man. Look, I know the world. I, I understand reality. I'm very scientific in my understanding of things. That's good. I'm all for science. I see more than, than this preacher up there in that pulpit. Well, I was, my response to that is that's the very proof of your blindness. And forget the preacher. This is the Word of God. And the Word of God is true. Its light blazes out at us. And if you can't see the light, you're blind. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your mind. It is deceitful. Don't even trust me. Believe this word. Believe Jesus Christ. He saves and He can save you. Trust in Him. In fact, flee to Him. 
Drop everything. Don't let anyone or anything fuddle you. Cast aside all, just like that blind man did, and run to him. You have nothing to lose but your guilt and everything to gain. God help you to do that and help all of us to be on the road with Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this wonderful passage that your servant Mark gave us, this, uh, this parable of teaching that the Lord gave us in his, the miracle he performed. It teaches us much about ourselves and much about you, how helpless we are, but how sufficient for every need you are. We thank you for that. We thank you for we who have believed for the life that you've given us, for the faith that you've given us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. May we follow him faithfully. We pray these things in his name. Amen.